Hello, blessed day to all. This is Mr. Criminology, Mr. Paul Janem Azores, and welcome to our Mr. Criminology Review Solutions. And today, I want to share to you the uh, review for the Law Enforcement Administration, specifically the introduction to police patrol. Let me share to you some key points that uh, you will be needing to pass your board examination in criminology. Of course, let's begin with the etymology of key terms. So it is the uh, history, the background that we need to know. Number one, of course, the word police. Police originated from the Greek word politeia, which means government of a city. So police, by that etymological term, we will know what is the function of the police. So police are, or it really means government of a city. The term was used to describe the group of civil officers governing the city and not necessarily the armed men guarding or policing the city. So sila, if they are the one who is guarding, who is, uh, this, they are the group of people na in charge in keeping the city, that they, it is not necessary for them to be armed. Uh, they can be unarmed, but they are organized body of men who are, who are tasked to do the job, to do that function of keeping the city. When the Romans conquered the Greeks, they changed the word slightly to politia. So from the word politeia in Greek, it was evolved into politia by the Romans who conquered the Greeks. The French changed the word to police and used it to describe deputized people who actually enforces the law. So there is a evolution in the term police, but the fundamental uh, job of a police officer is still present, is still the same, but they, they are just evolving and the functions are just adding or mas lumalawak, uh, they, they are becoming broader and broader in their function. And during the French period, these people, the police are the group of people who are deputized to actually enforce the law, such as the police today. The English and the Americans borrowed the word from the French and used it to describe a law enforcement officer. So today, the English term police, uh, as we know it, are the law enforcement officers, regardless of what the countries are calling them. Now we have the word patrol. Patrol originated directly by a German word patrolli that was described from the French patroller. Patroller originally means to walk through mud in a military camp or go through paddles. So, if you will um, trace the original word patrol, you can trace it back to the Germans, which literally means to walk through mud in a military camp. Now, we have two uh, common uh, use of the word patrol. First, patrol may refer to the regular tour made by a guard in a place in order to protect it or to maintain order. So we can see the word patrol ay hindi lamang sole function ng mga law enforcement officer. But patrol is also a function by the security guards or any person tasked to guard a place or to protect that same place or to maintain the order in that uh, area. Number two, patrol could, be, could mean a person or group such as the police or military unit sent to carry out a tour of duty in a certain place with a particular mission either for reconnaissance purposes or simply to provide protection. So kung kanina, uh, ginagamit ang word na patrol to describe a person or a group of people who have a tour of duty to guard that place, to maintain order in that place. But the second use of patrol could mean uh, any person or a group of persons such as the police and military who are now 
deployed to conduct reconnaissance such as gathering pieces of evidence or gathering intelligence or informations or for the purpose of protecting that to, uh, that area of responsibility or the uh, ROA. Next, the patrol is the backbone of the police department. There is a saying in the teaching of Leia that you can remove any department in a police organization, but you can never remove patrol because patrol is the backbone of any police organization. The proof to this statement is that patrol force is the only division in the police organization that cannot be eliminated. This is usually true in small police organization since it cannot afford to create divisions such as traffic, investigation, juvenile, and other specialized areas. So by a patrol, you can maximize the use of your uh, police force by conducting or by functioning as uh, what the other department are doing. So mahalaga dahil kaya na niyang gampanan ang pwedeng gampanan ng ibang department and in any department kinakailangan pa rin merong patrol especially yung mga may primary task of protecting a certain locality. The primary law enforcement body of the state is the police. The basic police mission are the following. First is to preserve order by enforcing rules of conduct or the law. So how uh, the patrol are important because they have the following roles. Remember, the police force is the primary law enforcement agency, especially in the Philippine setting. The Philippine National Police is the prime or the main law enforcement organization in the country. So the basic uh, mission is to preserve order by enforcing the rules of conduct. Remember, the police force is under the executive branch of government, which is tasked to enforce the law. So the police are the one enforcing the rules and the conducts, the rules of conduct and the laws of the country, the constitution, the special laws, etc., so that they can preserve order. So that people can live peaceably together in spite of differences. Number two was the same in the ancient communities as it, it is today in sophisticated and highly urbanized society. So kahit na modern time na tayo ngayon, we can deny that the function of the uh, police force are as same as the ancient period of the basic uh, job that they need to preserve life, protect lives and properties, and of course, to maintain order and prevent criminality. The golden rules of the police force, uh, they have the Ten Commandments for the police officers. Number one, in the performance of duty, thou shalt be guided by. What are the following guides that the police officers must observe, must carry, must keep? Number one, the first is absolute and uncompromising obedience to the laws of God. So if you will read the police creed, the police uh, pledge, the ethical standards, police officers are God-centered people. And above all, they need to be obedient to the law of God so that they can also avoid, um, avoid breaking the laws of this nation. Second is the constitution. Remember, the constitution is the highest law of the land. Any law that is inconsistent with the constitution will be declared void and null. So above all, they need to observe and be guided by the constitution. Number three, all the existing laws, the enacted laws. And fourth, the public welfare in general with ultimate purpose to secure, depend, and protect life, liberty, honor, dignity, and property is strictly in that order. Remember, it's all about the people we serve. It's all about the people that the police officers are serving. So they, their ultimate goal is to secure the following in this order, above all life, because uh, you, can, you might be protect the properties of the people, but if they lost their life, it is nonsense. So above all, first and foremost, they need to protect lives, their liberties, 
from any uh, un unlawful restraints, honor, dignity, and of course, property. The last. The second commandment for the police officers, thou shalt not enforce a law by violating another law. Yes, the, the police officer may be enforcing the law, but in order to do that, they violate the law, it will be also illegal. So in observing and in implementing the law, they need to be guided and to be keeping the existing laws. Number three, thou shalt uphold the law without fear, favor, reservation, or discretion. Indiscretion, I mean. So in upholding the law, they must disregard fear. They must not observe giving favor to certain people, certain groups, certain class. And it must be without reservation or indiscretion. They need to be wise. They need to use their wise judgment in enforcing the law. The fourth one is thou shalt not wrongfully or maliciously accuse anyone. Be an instrument to err to any wrongdoing nor violate human rights. So if you will observe the criminology curriculum today as a component of human rights education because we begin to realize that those who will be a future police officers must be the one protecting human rights, uh, respecting human rights, and they shall not wrongfully and maliciously accuse anyone. And they must never be an instrument to any wrongdoing and they must never violate the human rights that they ought to, to protect and preserve. Number five, thou shalt defend the weak, shield the helpless, protect the oppressed, and assist the grieved without distinction or prejudice, and be it a faith to die in line of duty with honor, valor, and dignity. So they are the weak defender, they are the shield of the helpless, they are the protector of the oppressed and they are the one giving assistance to the aggrieved regardless of their um, status. So it is an honor for a police officer to die in the line of duty with honor, valor, and dignity. Thou shall not employ excessive, unnecessary, and unreasonable force to, to prevent, repel, or suppress any act or omission punishable by law. So we have the principle that they must only use, they must never use excessive force or unnecessary force, but they are, uh, they can use reasonable force. They, the force must commensurate to the uh, response of the person to be arrested. So when they are uh, enforcing the law, doing their duty, they must observe the what we call reasonable force, employing of the reasonable force. Seven is thou shalt be gallant in defeat, humble in victory, yield honorably to righteousness and immediately acknowledge and correct a wrong humiliation or perversity. So talagang gentleman, talagang with integrity, with honor, with humility ang isang police officer. Thou shalt not disgrace the badge and the uniform, nor commit any act or omission in violation of law for material gains or ulterior motives. So being a police officer, you must respect the badge that represent not just your whole person, but the entire organization. Remember, you are the representative. The pol every police officer represents the whole organization. So their badge is the symbol of public faith and trust. So they must also uh, represent the entire organization with honor and they must never be the one violating the law that they ought to uh, enforce, especially with material gains. Thou shalt always live a modest life as true, honest, and de dedicated public servant. So being a police officer, they must not think that they are superior or above any person or the public, but they must always be modest in life. They must be true to themselves, to others, especially to God, 
and they must be honest. And in doing their job as public servant, they need to uh, think of the welfare of the public above all. So they must be dedicated public servants, not superior to anybody. And the number 10 is thou shalt always cherish, honor, and speak well of the organization and abide by the code and corpse and the, and the unit at all times. So they must um, cherish and honor and speak well of the organization. They need to build up the organization. They need to promote the trust of the public to the organization. Now we have the evolution of policing in England. During the Anglo-Saxon ancient England period, 600 to 1066 AD, the following policing, policing systems are practiced. Number one, we have the what we call prank pledge system. Prank pledge system is a policing uh, was carried out under a, a system called prank pledge or mutual pledge, whereby every male over 12 years old joined nine of his neighbors to form a titing man. So it means the 10 families will have one representative and those 10 men, male over 12 years old, will form the tithing men or the 10 men, the 10 men. A group of men whose duty was to apprehend any person who offends another and deliver that offender for trial. Anyone who failed to join and perform this obligatory duty was severely fined. Find thus policing responsibility lies on the hands of the citizen. So it is good because it is really the, the police of the people because they are the police from the people. So this group of men are the one tasked to apprehend any violators and bring them to trial. And if that, if that man will um, prevent or will fail to join this organized man, this uh, group of men, they will be severely fined because they have the task to protect one another. The second in England was the Tan policing. Tan was the forerunner of the word town. Under this system, all male residents were required to guard the town to preserve peace and order, protect life and properties of the people and other factors that disturbs peace and order. <coughs> Excuse me. So if the tithing men or the plank, plank pledge system are just uh, composed of 10 abled men but in this tan policing the all abled male citizen are the one to guard and to preserve the peace and order and to protect lives and properties of the people under their locality they are to preserve the peace and order because anybody that can that will disturb it must face consequences and we have you and cry. In this system, the complainant or the victim goes to the middle of the community and shout to call all male residents to assemble. The victim reports his complaints to the assembly. Consequently, all male residents will go after the criminal and apprehend him. So if you are a victim of a crime, you must go to the middle of the community and shout. And all able body men Whatever they are doing, they must leave that and respond. And after they gather together, you must tell them your concern and they will all go after that criminal to apprehend him. So the people are the one uh, enforcing the law in this setting. Now, we also have the royal judge system. The royal judge conducted criminal investigation and gave punishment fitted to the crime committed. This practice started the identification of criminals. So in this system, the royal judge are the one uh, that has the task to conduct criminal investigation. So they have, uh, uh, if you compare today, they have more broader uh, tasks during that time. And according to their findings, they will also the one to give punishment fitted to what they have committed. And by this time, the practice of identification of criminals was also initiated or started. 
We also have trial by ordeal. A suspect was required to place his hand over a boiling water or oil. If he would not get hurt, he will be acquitted. But when hurt, he would be considered guilty. Double jeopardy was prevalent during this period. So they are, um, they are as if during this time uh, giving to God the decision. But if you will do that today, uh, we can declare them as irrational way of trial. During the normal period, 1,066 to 1,285, the following are the significant contributions to the development of policing system. First is the Shire system. When King William Norman became the ruler of England, he divided his kingdom into 55 military districts known as the Shire, Shire Ribs. The Shire means a district while Riv means the ruler who made laws. Past judgment and imposed punishment. He was assisted by a group of constables, the forerunner for the constabulary. The term Shire Rib eventually became sheriff, the title of the chief of constables or police officers in a certain town. The traveling judge was held responsible in deciding cases that were taken from shy ribs due to some abuses. So what King uh, William Norman did during his time, his um, place was divided into 55 military district. Each district is called Shire and each leader in that district or ruler is called the Riv. That's why it was called Shire Riv. And they have a group of constables who use them or who help them in enforcing the law. That's why Shire Riv is the forerunner for the word sheriff and sheriff was known to lead the constables. And traveling judge are traveling as uh, what mentioned and they are the one giving decisions to the crime committed because of some abuses during this time. Now better be is the Legis Henry. This law was enacted during the time of King Henry I, which imposed the following features. Number one, law violations were classified as offense against the king. Policemen became public officials. The police and the citizens have the broad power to arrest. And lastly, grand jury was created to inquire of the facts of the law. This is the Legis Henry, the time of King Henry I. Let's move on to the next. In, 19, in 1195, King Henry of Hing, England issued a proclamation entitled Keepers of the Peace, requiring the appointed of, appointment of knights to keep the king's peace by standing as guard on bridges and gates while checking the people entering and leaving the city. We also have the, during the West, uh, Westminster's period, 1285 to 1500. Statue of, Statute of uh, Winchester, 1285, was enacted for law and order. This law introduced the system of watch and ward. Statute of uh, 1295 was enacted, which began the closing of gates of London during sunset. This has started the observation of curfew hours. So we can trace back the practice of curfew during the Statute of 1285, Westminster period. The justice of the peace was a position given to a respected citizen who has the power to arrest pursue and imprison the offender. Next is the Star Chamber Court was established a special court that tried offender against the state. Okay, let's see some personalities. Developments in policing system during the modern period. 17th to 19th century in England, King Charles II of England passed a law in 1663 that provided for the employment of night watchmen or bellmen to be on duty from sunset to sunrise. So that's the start of 
the night ship or the 24 hours guarding. They are called the night watchmen or the bellmen. Pagkalubog pagka ng araw hanggang bagos pa, pagsikat nito, they are the one guarding the place. We also have Henry Fielding. Henry Fielding in 1748 became the chief magistrate of Bow Street in London. He organized a group of men known as Bow Street Runner or the Tip Catcher. He later formed the Bow Street Horse Patrol whose duty was to patrol the main road that secured the travelers from highwaymen or highway bandits. Henry Fielding. We also have Sir Robert Peel. The British statesman in 1829 established the London Metropolitan Police, which became the world's first modern organized police force. It was later called the Scotland Yard. The development of British police system is especially significant because the pattern that emerged not only became a model for the American police system, but also had great influence on the style of policing in almost all industrial societies. P, uh, Robert Peel earned the title the father of modern policing system. Until today, in criminology world, he is called the father of modern uh, policing system. During 17th century in France, King Louis XIV maintained a small central police organization consist of some 40 inspectors who, with the help of numerous paid informants, supplied the government with the details about the conduct of private individuals. So these are the development up to the modern period. In Paris also, the positions of officers defaced was formed in 1791. This was the origin of the term, the peace officers. The French were the first to establish uniform police officer. They called Sergeant de Ville or the servant of the city. Other contributions of the French in the development of policing system are the following. Number one, A, conceiving street signs. So they are, sanilagaling yung mga street signages assigning horse house number as we have today, installing street lights for security, creating emergency and rescue services, use of police ambulances, use of warrant card, and ID signifying authority to arrest para mga IDs natin today. So, kaya sila rin yung uh, first to use uh, uniform. Early developments in policing system during the Spanish regime. Let's see. The police force during the Spanish regime was considered as part of the military system by the Spanish government, the local, locally organized police force, although performing civil duties and seemingly created for the sole purpose of maintaining peace, were in fact directly commanded by the current Colonial military government police force organized during Spanish period are the following, which I will I will discuss later. So, uh, during those time in the Spanish regime, uh, yung function ng police ay absorbed ng military. So the military are the one who are doing also civil duties such as the functions of the police today. And during uh, the Spanish regime. The organized police force are the following. Number one is the Carabineros, the Seguridad Publico, or the Mounted Police. I mean, Spanish, I mean, sorry for the term Japanese a uh, while back. It, it is the Spanish period. Carab uh, Carabineros, the Seguridad Publico, the Mounted Police, was organized in 1712 for the purpose of carrying out the policies of the Spanish government. The members were armed and considered as the mounted police, later they dis discharged the duty of a port, harbor, and river police. So under the police government during that time, uh, they are the armed men, they are the mounted police, pero at, in addition to their task, uh, they are the one also guarding the ports, the harbor, and the rivers. The known Guardia Civil, was the police organization created by the Royal Decree 
issued by the Spanish Crown government on February 12, 1852, it relieved the Spanish Peninsular troop of their works in Palacing Town. It consisted of the body of Filipino police, policemen organized originally in each provincial capital of the central provinces of Luzon under command of Alcalde or the governor during that time. So there are more on provincial troops during those times. But they are, uh, the, the officers are the Filipino. The Japanese military police, known as the Kempetai, were held responsible in maintaining peace and order in Manila and adjacent urban areas. Kempetai ruled in urban areas until General Douglas MacArthur returned on February 7, 1945, before the World War II. Remember, the Philippines was also um, occupied by the, the Japanese and their um, military police is called Kempetai, the one who in, were maintaining the peace and order, uh, specifically in Manila and in the nearby provinces or places where they have the rule during that time. But that end when General Douglas MacArthur returned. The Manila Police Department, which was created during the first American occupation, MPD, until today, uh, was renamed into the Metropolitan Constabulary during those days under the Bureau of Constabulary. We have the Insular Police Force, the IPF, was established on, the, on November 30, 1890, during the Filipino-American War, 1898 to 1901, upon the recommendation of the Philippine Commission of the Secretary of War. Next is the Insular Constabulary. Was created on July 18, 1901, by virtue of Act Number no. 175, titled as an Act providing for the organization and government of the Insular Constabulary. We also have the Manila Police Department, the MPD, was organized on July 30, 1901 by virtue of Act Number 183 of the Philippine Commission. The first chief of police was Captain George Curry, a U.S. Army officer appointed by the Taft Commission on August 7, 1901. Captain Columbus Payat was the last American COP or the chief of police of MPD before World War II broke out. On October 3, 1901, the Insular Constabulary was changed to Philippine Constabulary, the known PC back then, by virtue of Act Number 255, Brigadier General Henry T. Allen was the first chief of the Philippine Constabulary. He was the uh, PC chief from 1901 to 1907 for about six years, such that he was called as the father of Constabulary in the Philippines. The Philippine Constabulary was manned mostly by Filipinos, but officers were mostly American during those times. Revised Administrative Code of 1917 was approved a year before World War I. August 1914 to November 1918 ended. In Section 825 of this law, it states that the Philippine Constabulary is a national police institution for preserving the peacekeeping order and enforcing the law. Brigadier General Rafael Crame became the first Filipino chief of police. He served as the PC chief from 1917 to 1927 for about 10 years. That's why the general headquarters of the Philippine National Police was named after Brigadier General Rafael Crame, the Camp Crame. On November 1, 1932, Republic Act Number no. 3815, otherwise known as the Revised Penal Code of the Philippines, took effect. That until today, we are using the criminal law of the Philippines. In November 1938, Act Number no. 183 required the creation of the Bureau of Investigation. This agency should be the modification of the Division of Investigation from the Department of Justice, 
Finally, on June 19, 1947, Republic Act Number no. 153 was enacted, which created the National Bureau of Investigation, the NBI, the, the NBI that we have today. Colonel Antonio C. Torres was the first Filipino chief of police when Manila Police Department became an all-Filipino police organization from the police uh, lowest rank up to the uh, highest rank. The police, op the officers, the high rank officers are all Filipino during his time. Declared Manila as an open city when World War II broke out in 1941. During the World War II, Manila Police was placed again under the American control. Colonel Marcos Ellis Jones, a U.S. Provost Marshal who was named as the MPD Chief of Police just after the Manila liberation. These are the history. And we also have Colonel Lamberto T. Habalera, the first Filipino Chief of Police of MPD, Manila Police District or Department, appointed by the President Rojas and under the Republic government. So that's all for now. This is the introductory part of the law enforcement administration, especially in the subject police patrol. Uh, I just uh, delivered to you the historical background, the etymological terms, and watch out next time that I will be discussing more of these things. Thank you very much. Hope pumasaka sa yung uh, board examination and God bless you.